So this is the second time that I've tried recording this video. The first time I found that I was being too wishy-washy and dancing around what I wanted to say. I'm not someone who enjoys conflict. I don't like confrontation. But at the same time, I think that it's important to point out when things are not as good as they could be. And I think it's appropriate to point out when people in the community are having conversations that are not as genuine as they could be. So before I get into this, I do ask that you keep things civil in the comment section down below. Be mindful of the fact that one of the channel guidelines is to not be rude or cruel in comments that you write. Whether you agree with me, whether you disagree with me, or anyone else that I mention in this video, please, please try to keep things respectful when you go to comment. So with all that being said, let's talk about this. So Steven reviewed the new Godzilla Kong Monster Arts figures, and it went just about how everyone expected it to. Toward the end of the video, he talks about all the logical reasons that folks should have already picked up these characters if they ever intended to do so. I feel as though Steven has done a decent job of breaking down these figures in terms of detail and articulation in the past, because he didn't really get into it too much in this video. But when it comes to the commentary around the nature of these releases, I feel as though there's a lot of important details being left out. Don't get me wrong, you are free to love or hate these these things. I have no problem with that. I care more about being able to have an honest and genuine conversation around the releases, for better or worse. Before I get into all of that though, Steven does ask the question, who still doesn't have these molds after the five or six releases? Who's needed five years of convincing to pick up this Godzilla figure? Me. Yeah, I came to the realization that I've never handled this Godzilla mold before, and maybe it's because I've always been a little bit more uh, attentive to character accuracy, and there was something about the monster arts that just didn't do it for me. As time has gone on, I've cared less and less about accuracy and more about playability and expression of toys. And if this figure has been released again, for those who have missed out previously, then maybe I should put my money where my mouth is and I should pick it up and handle it and give you my honest thoughts on it. Now, if you're a longtime viewer, you know that I don't care about monster arts very much. Out of all of the figure maniacs, I have been by far the most critical and most negative and pessimistic about their releases. And I've always said that I don't find them to be fun. When they fall apart at the slightest touch, it's not fun. But a notable exception to this is my con exclusive Kong 21 figure. I really like that figure. I think it's a lot of fun. I keep him on my desk. I fiddle with him all the time. If you listen to the podcast that we put out last week, you might actually hear the squeaking of it as I'm talking because I'm fiddling with it. I actually really like the Monster Arts Kong figure. Could it be more accurate? Sure, but it primarily it's a fun toy and that's what I care about most in collecting these days. And with this realization that this is now what I care about most in my collecting, I decided, yeah, maybe I'll give the Godzilla a shot and, and see how it is. Like if I like the Kong so much, much in terms of playability, maybe Godzilla follows a similar pattern. And with that, here is the footage of my unboxing and first impressions of the figure. See? <laughs> this is how you know that I'm not a Monster Arts fan, because clearly I opened the fucking thing backwards. No tape, okay. I don't think that's usual. Okay, so here's the beam effect. Looks alright. Here's the the higher version. I think I, I think I prefer the higher version. Translucent mouthpiece. Looks good. Couple of alternate hands. I guess they're. I, I'm realizing I know very little about this release. I guess they're yeah they're a little bit more closed. Okay, so uh. Going to gently, gently take this out of the box because I spent two days in the coal mines working to afford this figure and I'm not going to ruin it all by just roughhousing with it. All right, let's go. Oh no. Let's take. Oh no. Okay, so I'll get to this point in a little bit, but I don't know if that tail joint socket is supposed to be like that. I I'm pretty sure it is. That feels really tight. Well, here, let me get this out of the way. Let's go. Go with this. I might have to heat the joint. 
those of you who don't know, I usually hate having to do any kind of heat treatments on my toys. I understand that they might go through a long, arduous journey to get here, but you pay so much for these figures, I, I really don't like having to kind of put them put them together in such a careful, careful manner. If it's just a snap-on thing, whatever, but that should be it. So, yeah, I think uh, I will probably have to heat treat that, but I should be able to, should be enough for the purposes of this of this video so here he is first impressions knees feel very similar to Haya it's an added ankle joint A ankle joint in comparison to Haya um, torso rocking his, ar his arms all messed up <laughs> Let me see if I can get this oriented properly. Really, seems like with Monster Arts releases, you really need to take your time to understand how things move, lest you break them. The jaw, the jaw doesn't, doesn't seem like it wants to move too much. Oh, and it fell apart. Okay, whatever. I'll just go fix that afterward. Yeah, something going on with the jaw doesn't want to close all the way. It's about as close as I can get it. One thing I do like about this release is the fact that you don't have to swap heads for the the beam effect. I know it makes the neck look all kind of broken and disjointed, or at least it can. But it, the playability of being able to just do that, I appreciate. And the fact that I have a screen accurate version from Haya already really takes some of the burden or responsibility off this release to like look perfect for me like if this one is meant to just be enjoyed i i think that i can get i can get there but first impressions you know tail notwithstanding it's fun like i i feel like i can pose it i can get a lot of movement out of it and get some really dynamic poses that i'm not going to be able to get out of haya so once i figure out how to get this arm situated properly and once i get the tail on in a with a solid connection, I can see myself having a lot of fun with this thing. Now, some folks are going to be asking me why I'm not doing any close-ups with my with my other camera. And the reason is because when I'm enjoying my figures, I'm enjoying them at arm's length. When they're on my shelf, they're actually quite a fair distance away. And so the little details don't bother me because I'm not eye-fucking my toy when I enjoy them. Yeah, I can, I, I could mess with this, man. I, I can get behind this guy. I think he's actually pretty fun. For the price, you know, it's a pretty steep price. So uh, in Canada, it's a hundred Canadian dollars. Haya toys cost seventy Canadian dollars up here in Canada. So for thirty extra dollars, you can have something that's a little bit more poseable. It is a little bit more stylized, but that's fine. So yeah, I'm gonna take a little quick break and then I will get that tail on. So it's been a few days since my unboxing and I've had a chance to fiddle with it, kept it on my desk, played around with it. My impression is that while it's a shame that it's not more accurate to the movie, it's pretty accurate, but it's not exactly accurate. I think that it offers more articulation and the ability to express the character than the Haya version does. I don't like the fact that I have to heat treat the tail, but this is not something that is exclusive to Monster Arts. And if you picked up the recent Haya Ghidorah, then you know this fact painfully so. But I think that the figure is neat. I like that I can get him into more emotive poses. Like I like this crouch down look, look makes him look a bit more feral, sort of like how he was in his final fight with Kong in 2021. If you already have this mold, I can see why you might skip this release. I don't think that this is, necessarily intended for you but i like i also like how the paint looks the paint looks way better in person than it does in the promotional shots i can see the appeal if you don't have the mold already but even if you have the mold if you really like the mold you like all the different variations that's what this hobby has always been about picking up different colorways of the figures that you like and with that let's talk about steven's video i will try to keep my comments as constructive as possible as steven himself said he is open to and so i will kindly ask that you keep any comments constructive as well steven reviews the figures he's reviewed the molds before he points out the paint details all that good stuff there's nothing really new in terms of that but half of the video is a discussion that steven offers regarding the nature of these figures and their release he offers three clapback 
arguments as to why you should already have these or you don't need these and something to that effect. If you missed out on the Godzilla versus Kong figures, he says that that argument doesn't hold water as to why you don't already have them due to the abundance of availability of stock. This is a very USA centric a take on the abundance of stock available for these figures. In Canada, the GVK releases sold through pretty well, and while Kong is still available here and there, Godzilla is much harder to find, and the units that I can find range from 125 Canadian dollars to 150 Canadian dollars. Whereas the GXK releases up here in Canada are selling for 100 Canadian dollars. With all the US e-tailers that Steven mentions, for someone up here in Canada, like a neighboring country, like we're right here, Importing these figures means import charges and a shipping cost that eliminates any kind of discount, right? And, and then the conversion rate on top of that, it, it's done. Like this is just not an option for us. So in the case of Godzilla, I can now pay $25 less for a figure that has a beam effect in the box where GVK didn't have that. I would say that's a great opportunity for Canadians. I think it's also really important to remember that Monster Arts releases are primarily targeted toward the Japanese market. I was talking to Michael over at the Articulation series, and if you don't know Michael or the work that he does, Michael is as big of a Monster Arts fan as I am of Super 7, if not far larger probably far larger. In fact, maybe I should start my own series like Michael does. I'll call it uh, Super 7, the Inarticulation series. Michael has been paying very close attention to the performances of all of the Monster Arts releases, not just Godzilla, so Gamera and Monster Hunter included. Michael explained that the Godzilla vs. Kong Monster Arts releases performed very well in Japan. The pre-orders sold out basically immediately, and the stock that was reserved for initial release sold out within a week. These figures were issued twice across North America, and it looks like they might have been issued again very recently. But once the demand in North America was met, you saw Kong mostly. You might be able to find Godzilla here and there, but it was mostly Kong that you were still able to find in excess, and you might be able to find him in discounts or, or liquidation. And we've seen this phenomenon before with the ultimate sales from Super 7 over at websites like Big Bad Toy Store Entertainment Earth. And the issue, as Brian explained in our conversation a couple weeks back, is that even if a figure is amazing, once you've satisfied the demand, once everyone who wants one has one, it doesn't matter what the price of the figure is. Like people just aren't there for it. They already have one, what's left? It's just a customer that doesn't care about these things. At least in Japan, where these figures were issued only once, it seems as though there was still an appetite for these molds. I think Bandai saw this potential too and wanted to capitalize on it. At this point, websites like AmiAmi, uh, Hobby Genki, Amazon Japan, there's a, a whole bunch of others, they're all sold out in these Japanese e-tailers. They're, they're, these figures have sold out. I should clarify, Godzilla 2024 is sold out. Kong is sold out in some of these locations, but Godzilla is sold out in more locations. So Steven's point here around availability is a geographic one. It doesn't apply to me here in Canada, neighboring the United States, and it certainly doesn't apply to Japan, where these things are primarily targeted. I think that this is a good reminder that not every Godzilla product is for you, and that's okay. There's going to be things that you don't have to pick up, and you shouldn't feel compelled to pick them up if you don't want them. And I think that Steven himself would agree with me here. Steven's second clapback is that if you you like how these figures look, he questions the standards that you hold for your collection. And to me, this is taking a toy review far beyond its reasonable limits. Steven goes from reviewing a figure to critiquing you as a customer, asking you to reflect on what you spend your money on. As someone who has consistently preached to like what you like unapologetically and to let others enjoy what they enjoy, I think this is a really poor practice as a reviewer. This next bit I'm not saying is true, I'm saying this is the impression that I have, I could be wrong. It feels to me like Steven has been wanting monster arts to be better for a long time now, and now he is diverting his frustration away from the company making the product toward the customer who is buying the product. And I'll elaborate on this in a little bit. I've seen a sentiment in the community that the customers that are buying Monster Arts are contributing towards a complacency in being happy with the product quality that you're getting. And I just don't see that. If a company makes a good for a target customer and the target customer is buying that good in droves, like without issue, where is the problem exactly? You might say that people are spending all this money on a product that is of lesser quality, and that is strictly not true. They're spending all this money on a product you think 
is of lesser quality. The Monster Arts customer seems just fine by and large, and to insist that they are being held hostage by a product line, or that they deserve better from Bandai, is to impose a savior mentality that I think the world can do without. Steven's final point is that if you've come out on the other side of his logical arguments as to why these shouldn't exist, and you still want these things, he has nothing left to say, and you should go for them. Think of how belittling that is to hear, that if you still want these things, you are acting outside of logic and reason. He's been to comment on his video from someone who talks about how their life circumstances up to this point have prevented them from really getting into the line, and how they like how the Kong looks for this release, and how they don't really have the money to afford the Comic-Con exclusive version with more accessories, and so they're looking forward to picking this up despite the fact that they think that this is a shameless cash grab that embarrasses the character. It's a bit strange to me. You like the colors of the release, you like that it's a little bit cheaper, at the cost of accessories you're not going to use, but you still think that it's a shame and a disrespectful homage to the character? Anyway, the point here is that there are plenty of examples of folks who up to this point may be looking to pick up this release, may not have had the opportunity to pick up the release, to the point where Steven's blanket statement of you should already have these already is just very presumptuous and incredibly dismissive. There's the pinned comment person. There's someone I know who talked about how the last few years were very unkind to them and so they sold their collection to make ends meet. They are now in a place where they are looking to pick up some releases that they enjoyed, including the Monster Arts Godzilla. There are probably teenagers now who have outgrown the Playmate stuff and might be looking to pick up their first Monster Arts release. Maybe you hated the metallic blue mouth paint on the GVK release like I did. Everyone's life situations are so different. We all come in and out of this hobby at different points in our life. It is so bizarre to me that you would take aim at a customer and tell them that they are acting illogically, that they are circumventing all of the rational arguments that you've put forward. Steven begins to wrap up his review by talking about how it's his job as a reviewer to make sure that you go into a purchase as informed as possible. And I actually agree with him there. I actually think that he does a good job when he has a figure in front of him of pointing out where paint applications are good, where they're not great, where articulation is. Like I watched his videos for my Haya Ghidorah for my Rebirth Gamera because he breaks down these things in such detail. But the point of disconnect for me here is that I don't think there's any world where Steven was going to give these things a fair shake when this was his initial reaction to the announcement. And if I may continue on this idea for a few minutes, I think that Steven has been very vocal about his distaste for what Bandai has been doing recently. Just look at the thumbnail of his Crimson Typhoon review saying Bandai could never, as if Bandai hasn't already. When the Movie Monster series releases for Godzilla Kong were revealed, I saw many people surprised by the fact that they appear to be reusing and building upon the previous previous molds for Godzilla vs. Kong rather than being all new tooling. And I'll remind you, you can hate them, you can like them, I, it doesn't matter to me. But here's the interesting part. Steven uses a few examples of recent movie monster series releases to support his argument that Bandai should have done better, whatever that means, with these releases. Fair enough, but when a user pointed out that Steven had used examples of particularly strong movie monster series releases when there are plenty of underwhelming ones, he said that Steven was cherry picking the examples that he used. And what did Steven say about this? Yeah, I cherry picked, so what? So what? If you admit to cherry picking, why should I trust the examples you use in your review? How can I trust that you're going to give these toys a fair shake when you've just admitted that you're going to use examples to drive home whatever point you need to make. At this point, it's my opinion that Bandai is just on Steven's shit list and they're going to have to work overtime to make their way off of it. He recently reviewed the Haya Toys Kong Skull Island figure and spent a bunch of time talking about why the new Monster Arts figure falls short. We were talking about a review of a different product from a different company of a different incarnation of a character, you can review it without bringing the monster arts in. If the monster arts is as bad or as needless as you say it is, it offers nothing by way of comparison. The Haya figure will stand out on its own. Which, while I'm at it, uh, it's a great figure. The articulation's good, uh, but the fact that he looks pretty much nothing like Kong Skull Island uh, does take away from me, even though he is an articulated and he's a fun toy. Ah, crap, my timer. So to summarize, I feel like Steven doesn't do a great job in painting a picture of why you should already have these releases. Because there is no good reason for why you should have these releases. Whether you're new to this hobby, old to this hobby, everybody's life is different. He actively criticizes viewers or customers 
who want these things, who will pick these things up, and he admits that he'll cherry pick examples to drive home whatever point he wants to make. I think taking a break from reviewing Bandai toys might be good for Steven. There's a lot of good stuff coming down the pipeline, whether it's Haya or other companies. I think that the, I think that Steven could use a palate cleanser. And if not, I will say this: if we are holding toy manufacturers to a higher standard. I think that we should hold toy reviewers to a higher standard. I'll tell you a little bit about why I haven't reached out to Steven directly regarding, you know, my feelings and my impression of his video. I'm mindful of the time that Burger King publicly put McDonald's on the spot and like had this whole advertising campaign trying to get a collaboration going to sell, I think it was called the McWhopper at the time. And then after a couple of weeks, McDonald's responded publicly just being like, no, we're not doing it. And next time you could just send an email. So why make the video instead of talking to Steven directly? When Steven and I have different opinions on topics regarding Godzilla collecting, we're just, we don't really have chemistry. Let me give you a few examples. Back during one of his chats with Veebs, Brian from Super 7 mentioned that he didn't feel as though there was enough demand and that enough people would buy a Gabara Ultimates figure to make it worth it for the company to make one. And on Steven's Discord server, I said that I understand Brian's hesitation and that there is a limited number of people who would ever be interested in buying a Gabara figure. And might I add, 28% of you agreed with me. Steven took my statement as nobody would buy a Gabara figure. To which I replied, that's not what I said, and it became a back and forth, arguing, yes you did, no I didn't, yes you did. If we can't agree on what the words I'm using actually mean, then we're never going to come to an agreement on the topic that we're discussing using those words. I've truncated the text here for readability, and I've cut out a lot of the messages that were happening from other people between mine and Steven's chat, but you can join his public Discord server and you can see the conversation for yourself. We also happen to have different stances on relationships with companies. To end things off, I want to tell you a little bit about a Twitter post that I shared, I think it was two weeks ago at this point, maybe three. I shared a little bit of a ramble or event about the current discourse regarding Godzilla collectibles, how there is so much out there, there's so much opportunity, and yet people are seem uh, more unhappy than ever. I'll summarize my thoughts, but if you want to read it, you can pause it right now. I was generally bummed out by the current discourse of Godzilla collectibles, where it feels like good releases are talked about for like a week, and then they're just gone into the ether. And then there's bad releases or underwhelming releases that get dragged on forever. Some of you agreed. A lot of you engaged with the post, so thank you very much. But if I told you that there was someone who responded to the post saying that they weren't observing this, can you figure out who? Like, I don't, I don't have to tell you, right? Like, you know who it is at this point. Steven is allowed to have his opinions on these figures and on this, this culture of collecting. I would never say otherwise. What I will say is that he has a responsibility as someone with a following to cover things in a more genuine and transparent light. He should be taking greater care to separate his subjective feelings from the objective nature of this hobby and its hobbyists. I am not alone in thinking that he is one of the larger creators in this space that has been on a bit of a negative bender lately. And when he takes time to comment on my post saying that he doesn't see the negativity, then I think it's time for a little bit of self-reflection. I'd like to thank all the Category 3 channel members for their continued support, as well as everyone that likes, comments, and watches my videos. I appreciate you all so very much. Twitter and Discord links are in the description. Thank you for watching, and I'll talk to you again soon.